Hey, chemistry students. So we are about to get into a unit where we will learn more about electrons and how electrons behave in atoms. And then after that, we'll learn more about how electrons behave in molecules and compounds. And the main way that we have of investigating electrons in atoms or molecules is through the use of light. And so let's talk a little bit about light and what light is and is not. And one of the things that light is, is that light is the generic term for anything that is a part of the electromagnetic spectrum. And the way light works, the way that electromagnetic waves work, so EM waves, oops, EM waves, is that these are just like the typical waves that you could picture in water at the ocean or in a lake or a, a pond or something like that, where we're going to picture them as having some sort of an amplitude, which is the distance between the top and the bottom. And there's some stuff we can measure here that we'll get into a little bit as we go. The other thing we can picture with these, and I'm gonna to try to use a different color here, is that we can picture waves that are just a little bit different. So that red wave there has a different amplitude than the black wave but that red wave also has some different things going on with it, okay? And for electromagnetic waves specifically, these are two dimensional. And what I've shown here really is one dimension of the wave, the up and down here, okay? And this wave that we see on the paper might represent say the electric field of the wave and that that electric field is pointing in different directions as this wave moves along this axis. And what we want to picture here, if this is the electric field, is we want to picture coming in and out of the page of paper. We want to picture another wave that happens to match this, and it's coming up and down. And those two waves together are really what electric mag electromagnetic waves are like. Now, on this picture here, there's a few things we can measure. We can measure the amplitude, and we can measure something called the wavelength. And the wavelength, we're going to symbolize with this Greek letter lambda. Lambda is how we would pronounce it. It's almost like a upside down wavy y okay and there's a couple different ways that you might see that lambda shown but what this really is is this is called the wavelength and this will always be the distance between neighboring crests or neighboring troughs so crest to crest trough to trough this should be the same or from any one spot on the wave to another spot where the wave is doing the same thing. So all of these lengths, all of these distances would all be wavelengths. The other thing we can measure is we can measure amplitude. And so if we look at this distance here, this distance is the amplitude. We won't use amplitude all that much in chemistry, we'll use wavelength a lot more. And then if this wave is moving, then there's other information we can get from that. Some of these terms we'll see more used in class on um, after this video, and that'll be when we do a lot of the math. So this video right now is really just meant to be more conceptual. And on this electromagnetic spectrum, really we're talking about light, and the type of light that you're probably the most familiar with would be called visible light. And so what are the colors of visible light that you can see? And hopefully you're saying to yourself that you can see the colors that we typically call Roy G. Biv. Roy G. Biv. And those colors, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, violet, 
these are organized in a particular direction. And the direction that these are organized in <clears throat> is from left to right, their wavelengths are actually decreasing. So the wavelength of red light, we typically think of that as being 700 nanometers. And I said, we're not gonna do math in this video, but I am gonna give you a couple of numbers. And violet light, violet light is, ends at around 400 nanometers. So notice that as you go left or right here, the wavelength is actually decreasing. So the wavelength is actually increasing as we go to the left. So lambda or a wavelength increases to the left. And so we could also talk about these and we could talk about these in terms of lengths as longer and shorter. So red light is going to have a longer wavelength than violet light. So red light is longer wavelengths than violet light, okay? Um, let's go ahead and fill this in and uh, we can think about other regions of light, especially those regions that are near red and violet. And hopefully when you think about a region of light or the electromagnetic spectrum that is near red light, hopefully you think about infrared light, infra red. And infra really means below. And so what is below for this? Well, it's really energy. And so on our line here, if wavelength increases to the left, then energy increases to the right. Okay. And infrared light, this goes, um, from nanometers down to around say micrometers. So micrometers maybe is where infrared light would stop. Below infrared, then we get into what's called the microwave region. But microwaves are really more typical for Microwaves are really more typical of say millimeters in terms of wavelengths. So I always got confused and thought microwaves were micrometers, but they're actually much longer, more like millimeters. And even when you're talking about millimeters and longer wavelengths, you start to get into the region where we might think about radio waves existing, okay? So we're not gonna put numbers with these. The um, the differences between these regions are pretty fuzzy when we kind of look at how these work for chemistry. And uh, so now let's think about stuff that's higher in energy than violet light. So what region of light can you think of that's near violet, but it happens to be higher in energy than violet? And hopefully you said ultraviolet. The ultraviolet light that we use in the laboratory will go from 400 nanometers to about 200 nanometers. Ultraviolet light technically goes a little bit shorter than that if you're out in space or something, but for what we're able to use on earth, we're gonna typically say all UV ends at 200. Ultra in this case, of course, means above. So this light ultraviolet is above violet, but it's above violet in terms of its energy. If we continue from here past ultraviolet light, then you get into X-rays. These are much shorter, okay? And then past X-rays, we have gamma rays, and you could even have cosmic rays. And all these regions of light can be used in some way in chemistry. So we can use X-rays to study atomic arrangements. So x-rays can help us see what materials look like in terms of how, where the electrons are, where the atoms are. So x-ray diffraction is a common method. That's how they actually discovered the structure of DNA. Ultraviolet and visible light together, we can use to excite electrons 
in atoms or bonds. And that in turn is going to be related to the molecular identities. So we can use ultraviolet and visible light to investigate what kinds of molecules you might be looking at. Infrared can be used to vibrate bonds. And those vibrational energies will be different depending on the specific atoms that are attached to those bonds. So a carbon oxygen single bond will have a different vibrational energy than a carbon oxygen double bond. And we also can even use microwaves in science. Microwaves actually cause molecules to rotate. And you can look at those rotational energies and you can figure out something about what the molecules are that you're looking at with that kind of information, especially for smaller molecules. So let's say you're on a space mission, like say uh, Perseverance on Mars. And if you were looking for evidence of water, then you would have a microwave instrument that could look for the presence of water. Water would have very specific rotational energies associated with it. You could also have an infrared spectrometer where you could cause bonds to vibrate and you could see if you see those OH bonds that are typical of water. Likewise, any of these other regions you can use as long as you have a source of the radiation and a detector that can pick it up. The only other thing to say here really about these waves is that not only do we use wavelength and energy, but we can also use something called frequency and frequency also increases to the right. I'm just going to write frequency two. So increase energy increases to the right and frequency two. Okay. So the frequencies of cosmic rays are higher than the frequencies of gamma rays. So what does it mean when we think about a frequency? Well, if we picture a wave here, okay, and this wave is moving, as that wave moves, the time that it takes, or the number of crests rather that pass a particular point in a particular amount of time. So one, two, three, and let's say that was all in one second. Well, then that frequency would be known as three Hertz. We would see three cycles of the wave per second. And um, that frequency, the number is related then to the speed of the waves, but it's also related to the wavelength. So if you look at the red wave, the red wave has a shorter wavelength than the black wave. And if it's moving at the same speed, there's going to be a lot more peaks of that red wave that pass. There would be one, two, three, four, five, six peaks that pass. So it's just about twice the frequency of the black wave, okay? So we've got these handles on waves that we're gonna do math with when we get together again in class. We've also got these regions of light that we can use. We wanna know what the relative relationships are between these regions of light in terms of wavelength or energy and frequency. We wanna know which regions of light are associated with higher energies and which regions of light are associated with lower energies. And the final thing really to say about this is we also want to have an idea about what kinds of energies can ionize. And so when you think about that word and you think about ionizing radiation, ionizing means that you're taking that energy and you're creating ions. Well, to create ions, typically you want to think about removing electrons. So the, this light that's ultraviolet and higher energy, and it's not all ultraviolet, but it's a decent portion of it. This has enough energy for a lot of atoms and molecules like say DNA or water, where they can actually remove electrons from those atoms because those electrons take on so much energy that they leave the atom behind. And those ions can then cause other problems for us. That's one of the sources of things like cancer. Um, and mutations in your nucleic acids within your cells. So this energy past this point is ionizing because it has enough energy to remove electrons from atoms and molecules. And so ultraviolet, X-rays, gamma rays, even cosmic rays from space 
These are all considered to be ionizing radiation. Technically, in terms of the amount of energy involved, things like infrared light and microwaves and radio waves do not have enough energy to be considered to be ionizing. And so at least in terms of that pathway, we don't consider these types of radiation, electromagnetic radiation in this electromagnetic spectrum. We don't consider these lower energies, radio microwaves, infrared, as capable of causing cancer. Now, there might be other mechanisms where they can do that, but they're not doing it through ionizing pathways, which is the typical pathway that we see for causing or creating cancer mutations. So I hope this is helpful. If you've got questions about this, please ask. Again, this is kind of covering the main ideas where you want to know what the arrangement is. You want to know how these energies relate to each other, what types of um, electromagnetic waves are actually considered to be ionizing.